It brings me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker. He's from Aarhus BSS, Aarhus University. Not showing any favoritism whatsoever. Mr. Carson Rosenskull is here to talk to us today about breaking the walls of mortality forecasting. Big round of applause for Carson. Thank you. I'm ready. Yes. So the last century has seen huge and unprecedented improvements in life expectancy all over the developed world. Here, among others, Denmark, which has seen it and improved from around 50 years to 80 years. So this improvement ha obviously has huge impacts on uh, a wide range of uh, in societies. Yeah. So the life expectancy is basically just an intuitive way to uh, describe all the age-specific uh, death rates. So, in general, it's very important to have accurate forecasts uh, of the mortality and life expectancy for both governments and pension funds, as, uh, th as this affects how we decide the pension age or how much should be saved and so on. However, there is a general problem in this field that we have two competing methodologies on how to uh, predict the future mortality or life expectancy. And this obviously in leads to an to a undesired uncertainty. So what we have done is that we create a unifying framework in mortality forecasting where we, this is made possible by using some techniques that is commonly used inside in economics or econometrics. So historically, historically the two different approaches is to either use demographic theories about how the mortality develops with respect to age. That is one approach. The other approach is to use statistical factor modeling in general, which do not use any theoretical uh, background. So what we have done is that we reformulate the de demographic theories using these econometric tools to into a statistical factor model framework as well. So more than create a unifying framework, we also are able to pr uh, improve upon, resisting, uh, upon existing models. And that is the main, uh, the main thing here is that we are able to identify relations between the age-specific death rates between each age that are stable over time. So when we identify things that are stable over time, we can use this in predicting the future mortality or life expectancy and we find that this creates an, a significant improvement on existing methods. And this is especially the case for longer horizons forecasts, which is also what the governments and pension funds are most concerned with in terms of reserving and changing the life expectancy, uh, the pension age. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Carson. Yes. The jury? Questions? You may need a microphone for that. There you go. Just, um, just to go back, what is the big problem with the inaccuracy in, in, uh, in the forecasting uh, life exp expenses? So, early on, we, we didn't really forecast the life expectancy improvement, so we just took what was uh, given inside pension funds. So, that has resulted in a a number of bankruptcies among pension funds. And we, we decide, the governments as well, they decide how much they should uh, use in, in, in various medis on medicine and all kind of stuff. But we also have to decide the retirement age. And of course, that has a huge impact whether we live longer or not. So this is also, you've also seen the increases in retirement age around Europe, but they have come like with a delay because people didn't, didn't uh, anticipate it well enough. So it's very important to have accurate forecasts to, to like avoid bankruptcies, defaults. Yes? Um, I imagine there are other uh, models for forecasting. 
like you can forecast the weather and <laughs> things yeah. like that. But what, what's the what's the specific about your model of forecasting? So, in general, there has so you know the demographic theoretical approach. They didn't have any. They they didn't. They were they were like desired very much because you had theories about how the mortality should behave with respect to age, but it didn't predict. Well, it was very bad at predicting. But what we have done by reformulated into a statistical factor model, we are able to produce a model that actually predicts better than existing model. And we have, and we find this relationship that is stable over time. It's called a co-integrating relation, very a statistical term that is stable over time. And when we get something that is stable over time, then we can use this stability in forecasting. So this would also be the case in like 10 years, 20 years when we forecast. But and this this has not been like incorporated in usual models. That's a main advantage. So uh, Pete Hein once said that it's difficult to do forecasts, particularly when they concern the future, right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> I know. So how will you know if uh, your how will you know that your model is better than the existing models before it's too late and another so pension fund has gone bankrupt? So we have lo used a lot of the, the procedures that you can use to test the forecasts, uh, predict the predictive ability of a model, which is like uh, some complicated statistical techniques, but it basically uses how good I are at predicting data. So we have data actually for a long time from, 80, 80, from the 18th century on mortality in, in a lot of countries. And then we can use this to recursively estimate and forecast and then see how good we perform. And we significantly outperform existing model in general. And the a problem is with this... Yeah, but you also see that in the latest periods it's better. But we also s the, the idea by finding a, a stable relation. So this is relation is stable over time, and we are quite certain that that would be the case as well in the future. So we actually have some information, whereas the existing models do not have any uh, requirement of, of stable relation that should hold. So that is just basically. Uh, it's called a random walk, but it's just some unstable relation they forecast. And it's naturally more uncertain if you forecast something unstable than if you forecast things, something stable. So that's there. Can you elaborate a bit on how your research can um, benefit the government or the public authorities? So the government, they decide so the Welfare Commission, they, decide, they, they, they published a report a couple of years ago about how the life expectancy would increase throughout the 100 years ahead. So you use this, and uh, then from this they decided the retirement age, how it should increase, and all that stuff. But, uh, but we have already seen that that model has done terribly wrong in the last 10 years because it was an unstable relation they used. So we can use this to like better set the retirement age and inc increase it in retirement age. But you could also use it when you want to see how many people will live to a certain age, because you know that at some point they will, uh, the, the, me the expenditures to medical, uh, the medical expenditures and stuff like that will increase. Uh, enormously at, at some age. Final question from the jury. Yes. This stable factor that you found that sort yeah. of makes your model unique. Yeah. Um, where does it come from? Uh, is it? Can you put some words on so what it is? So usually they just. So we have uh, age-specific death rates from zero to 110, and then you just use a general statistical method, and and then find some trend in this data, and then use predict this. But what we do, we, we divide the, uh, the ages up to infant mortality, and then there's this called accident hump, which is around the late teens, where 
especially men die from accident hump, women die from, uh, from uh, maternal deaths when they give birth, and then you have a, as, uh, but this, this has been falling, especially the last 50 years. And then you see you have a, an increasing mortality with respect to age after that, that's due to senescence. So what we see, so we create, we, we go in, that's very technical, so we go in and put these factors and then an effect, a factor that affects all ages as well. And then when we do this, we, have, we can extract some trends for each of these models instead of just a general trend. And then between these, we're able to find a, a relation between these trends that is always stable. And that's the difference. So we, all, we, don't, we, won't, we know that the changes in those goes at a specific rate, which is kind of technical, and I can't go further into details, but... <laughs> okay, great. We have time for a quick question from the audience. <laughs> no? If you were born today, what's the life expectancy for someone, just out of curiosity? So that was f the last uh, known data from... La we don't have data for 2000. Right. And the age yet. of retirement is... Today is... In Denmark is... 67. 67. But, you, okay. but this is... Yeah, okay... Is uh, often confusing. This is just the period life expectancy. Right. That's based on all the mortality rates based today. So this doesn't incorporate future improvements in right. life expectancy. Right. So because they are uncertain. Right. So, so there's a lot of variables that you can't really account for yeah, in the so, model. So you, so if you want, you could also create the true, some would say, life expectancy, but that would be uncertain because you will have to predict the future mortality rates and death okay. rates. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Karsten. A big <laughs> round of applause for Karsten, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, one minute to score Karsten.